Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hope you're doing fantastic. We're continuing our reading of the wonderful book by Dr. Salah Fauzans. It is called Akida Tawheed, the Creed of Monotheism. And now we are in a new part titled The Conditions of the Testification Muhammad Rasulullah. Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah. Let us begin. So, he contends. They are the conditions, that is. To recognize his message and believe it in one's heart. To utter it and recognize it openly with one's tongues. So to say it and to openly speak of it. Following him by acting according to the truth he brought and abandoning whatever falsehood he prohibited. To believe him regarding whatever he informs us of amongst the matters of the unseen, past or future, loving him more than oneself, wealth, children, parents, and all of mankind, and giving preference to his statements above those of others, and acting according to his sunnah. So that's quite a lot, okay? And it is very important we try to implement everything. For me, it's been kind of hard to get to the loving him more than my children. That's been difficult, but I think that's where study comes in. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open your own chest. Okay, number four. The implication of the shahadatain. The implication of la ilaha illallah is to abandon the worship of all other things, worship besides Allah, whose negation is indicated by the statement, La ilaha, none has the right to be worshipped and to worship him alone, not associating partners with him in worship, which is affirmed by the statement, Il Allah, but Allah. Okay, so, when we say the Shahada, we are making an oath, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we're going to abandon all the things that would make us commit shirk. It's very serious. Many of those who utter it, this testification contradict its implication. So they affirm and grant the right of worship which does not belong to creatures, to graves, tombs, idols, trees, and stones. These people believe that Tawheed, monotheism, is an innovation. And so they object to those who invite them to it and rebuke those who purify and worship solely for Allah. So if someone... Okay, so hold on. Stones reminds me a lot of minerals. There's a lot of people who worship minerals. I collect minerals because I like to look at them because I think it's so beautiful. Uh, so that's quite different. I don't think that the mineral has some special power. However, there are the Wiccans who have their different crystals and say there's energy and they arrange them in a certain way and all that baloney. I don't know, that's not me. I took a geology class and the geology professor had a wonderful collection of different minerals that just to me showed the beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. Right? Admiration is different than attaching supernatural powers to certain minerals. So when he says stones, I often think of, yeah, literal stone idols, but also minerals because people do, sadly, think that if you wear a certain mineral around you, you will get some power. I could go on and on about different things, but it just made me think of that. So, if you are going to use such a thing, you're violating the shahada. You're violating the implication of that because you are not implementing it. Okay, now the next part. The implication of Muhammad Rasulullah. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. This implies obeying him, testifying to his trueness, abandoning whatever he has prohibited, restricting oneself to acting according to his sunnah practices, abandoning anything other than that sunnah, such as innovations and granting preference to his statements above all others. So, bida, 
which is the word I learned of means innovation, right? This is very important because there's a lot of people who think you don't have to study the Sunnah. They say the, the Sunnah is the biography of the Prophet, the Sirah, and the Hadith, the, his narrations and stuff like that, right? The narrations. So if you take out the Sirah and the Hadith, where do you get the Sunnah from? That's why I don't think the Quranists, the people who think only the Quran, no Sahih Hadith, nothing like that. To me, it doesn't make sense how you can even have strong faith at that point. Because how are you going to love something you're not really familiar with? That's why I like Islam even more so because we have clues and insights on how to actually be a proper Muslim. Right? It's, it's like we have the Quran and then we get bonuses by having the Sunnah. So we learn what to do, the practices, through the Hadith. Right? Number five. Things which negate the shahadatain. These are the, the things that negate Islam. This is because the two testifications are the conditions, which by their profession bring a person into the fold of Islam. Okay, so when you say, La ilaha illallah, ashadu wa Muhammad rasulullah, when you testify that, the, that Muhammad is the messenger, peace be upon him, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that none has the right to be worshipped but Allah. You have done the two testifications. And you need to stay within the conditions so that you don't leave the fold of Islam. Professing the two implies understanding and recognizing their meaning. That's why I loved studying Islam before I said my shahada. Because I knew exactly what I was. You know, I learned more now, right? But I had more of a comprehensive idea. And adherence to their implications by fulfilling the symbols, duties of Islam. If he is dis defective in adherence, then he has detracted from the covenant he made when he professed the two justifications. Yeah, exactly. So if you're defective in that and implementing and adhering it, you need to be very careful because you made a covenant. And that's why the hijab, women covering, it's part of... The covenant, I, I mean, you need to be modest. That is a must. The Prophet, peace be upon him, made this clear. And obviously hedonism is not supported for women in the Quran. You need to be mindful. Things that negate Islam are numerous. The scholars of fiqh, Islamic jurisprudence, have produced a chapter for it in books of fiqh which they titled Chapter of Apostasy. The most important of these things, which negate Islam, are ten. They are mentioned by Sheikh al-Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab, rahimahullah, in his statement. Okay, cool. We're going to go through uh, this, the points here. So here we can see Dr. Salaf Fawzan compliments Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab. I'm reading the Removal of Doubts book by him on my second channel, Bibliophile Hermit, which I often share on the community tab on this channel, in case you want to go and see that. Okay, number one, associating partners with Allah and worship. Allah the Most High said, quote, Verily, Allah forgives not that partners be set up with Him in worship, but He forgives except that anything else to whom He pleases. Quran 4, 48, 116. Now, this is even more potent because, again, we are learning what Tawheed is and why we have to call to it and how we can be free. Learning about what causes shirk helps you to be free. I no longer get scared by some stupid witch. Not that I ever was afraid of them, but there, there's been some times where on social media which will like say she's trying to put the evil eye on me or whatever right she's got a little bird's nest of trinkets and whatnot and once you realize that those have no power but that everything happens by the permission of Allah and that you must turn to Allah for mercy right you are free because you realize it's not just about 
the tools they wield, but Allah has all the power, and they'll have none. It's it's very freeing. Also, he, the Most High, said, quote, Verily, whosoever sets up partners in worship with Allah, then Allah has forbidden paradise for him, and the fire will be his abode. And for the zalimun, polytheists, and wrongdoers, there are no helpers. Quran 5.72 So here again, we cannot innovate our own religion. There are some people who I've noticed who are part of Christianity, they claim to be, they'll mock the Orthodox Christians, and then they are cozying up to the heathens and the pagans and are getting really into New Age astrology. And that's how certain Christians, I think, go astray. Because they start to associate partners with Jehovah, whether they're a Unitarian or a Trinitarian. They have to be mindful not to blend in paganism to their faith. And if one of them is mocking those who strict to the most orthodox interpretation of Christianity and are adding in heathenism and thinking that they can just make up their own strand of Christianity, that's not right. So for us Muslims, we are very mindful of polytheism. We don't take from the other religions and then make our own new Islam, right? We know that Allah sent his messengers he sent his final messenger, peace be upon him. We have just Allah. There is no partners. So if you divide your worship by how another religion says, you're doing an act of shirk. You're setting up a partner of authority. That's not allowed. Okay? So for us, when we are going against them on Tawheed, the orthodox, the dogma of Tawheed, we're trying to help people because here, as we see in Quran 572, Paradise is not granted to the polytheistic ones. So it's very important that the people understand how to get rid of shirk and how we obeyed the sunnah as best we under as much as we cannot understand, right? As much as we can, right? We learn, we adapt it, we apply it, we, we keep on that to the day we return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we put our best foot forward. So we don't let people mock us for being Orthodox Muslims no matter what, right? So it's just really potent, those two quotes. He continues, Also, including an association of partners with Allah is the act of sacrificing to other than Allah, such as sacrifices to or at tombs or graves and to the jinns. So again, we see here, sacrifices to the jinns is associating partners in worship with Allah. This is an act of shirk. This is where you get into the occultists, okay? Interestingly, there's a lot of Native American graveyards. People built special things on top of those graveyards, and then they do occultic rituals on top of the graveyard. And so, when you have people who are, are doing rituals and sacrificing to the dark arts on top of a grave, you as a Muslim should not be there. Don't even go there, right? Just don't even, don't even play games like that. Because that's an act of shirk and paradise won't be granted to you if you don't repent and fix up what you're doing. Two, whoever places himself between, oh, whoever places between himself and Allah an intermediary which he invokes and seeks intercession with from and places his reliance upon, he's a disbeliever by consensus. Super important. What differentiates us from, let's say, Catholicism is ain't no saints for us, right? We don't say, oh, St. Peter, oh, yada yada, oh, Virgin Mary of Guadalupe. No. Virgin of Guadalupe. Virgin Mary, we don't even know, there's none of that going on. None of that. No St. Francis, none of that. No St. Valentine, you get it. Three, whosoever does not regard the polytheists as disbelievers, and 
one who doubts that they are disbelievers or views their beliefs regarding God as correct has disbelieved. This one to me is very, very important. Because when I've seen certain Christians, I shouldn't even call them Christians because they're heretics and blasphemers according to their own book. But they'll say like, oh, there's a lot of like um, truth in Hinduism. And if you're looking at that person, you're like, no. You can say they have some points there, but if you were a true Christian, you wouldn't be saying that. So for us as a Muslim, we should not say that those who, like the heathens, the, you know, the people who are still into the Norse mythology, we cannot take their views on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as correct and to believe them. See what I'm saying? We don't do that. We don't say that they, they're they going to teach us about the universe, about our existence. Sure, they may have some type of morals coming through, but we don't mix that in because that'd be innovation. We don't follow their guidance. We have ours. Four, whosoever believes that the guidance of someone other than Muhammad, peace be upon him, is better than his, or that the judgment of some other than him is better than his, such as those who prefer the judgments of tyrants to the judgments of the messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, and prefer their constitutions, oh, sorry, constitutions to the judgment of Islam. Now, this is interesting because we all realize that the hadiths come into a huge play here then, don't they? If you're supposed to guide by what the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, legislated for us and judge by it, we get that from the Quran and from the hadiths. So this would be interesting to see how would the Quranists, the people who reject all hadiths, navigate themselves. How would their moral compass be? Really makes you think, okay, there's more, but the video is long and I don't want it to freeze. I don't want it to freeze. So we'll pause there. We learned quite a lot, didn't we? So we really have to make sure that we are doing our best to adhere to the conditions of the Shahada Tain. That Muhammad is the messenger of Allah and then has the right to be worshipped but Allah. And to remember that we are not supposed to set up any partners in worship to Allah. It's a very serious thing. And we must not sacrifice to anything other than Allah. And we don't have no business trying to sacrifice to no jinn. Right? Case in point. You just avoid that altogether. You rely on Allah alone. You invoke Allah alone. You don't place any intercessors. Okay? You just gotta stick to that straight path. Stick to it. Hope you learned something. By the way, if you'd like to join my blog, it's www.subscribestar.com slash Milan Archive. Hope to see you there.